Welcome everybody to chapter seven, lecture on the vitamins. Today, we're gonna to be comparing fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. We're gonna discuss the different characteristics of fat soluble vitamins. We're gonna look at the different roles, food sources and precursors of vitamin A and the effects of vitamin A deficiency and toxicity. We're also going to discuss the roles of vitamin D, its sources, and the consequences of deficiency and toxicity. Likewise, we'll be doing the same with vitamin E and vitamin K. Then we'll move on to the water-soluble vitamins, where we'll discuss the roles of vitamin C, its deficiency and toxicity, as well as its food sources. We'll also go through all of the different B vitamins and discuss the same for each. We'll then describe how to choose foods to meet your vitamin needs, and we'll deba debate for and against taking vitamin supplements, such as a multivitamin. So just to start us out, all vitamins are essential. They are non-caloric uh, and they are organic, meaning that they have carbon. Now, the one exemption to this is vitamin D. Vitamin D, as you will see, is not essential because your body can create it when exposed to sunlight. But for the most part, we need to get vitamin D from foods as well. Vitamins, you'll find, have many different roles in the body. We'll go through each different vitamin and talk about its individual role in the body's physiological processes. Several vitamins, particularly vitamin A, will have a precursor. A precursor means your body can take that compound and convert it into that vitamin. And today we'll be specifically talking about beta carotene and how your body can convert beta carotene into vitamin A. We're going to separate the vitamins into fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. And remember, the fat soluble vitamins are going to be absorbed in your lymph whereas the water-soluble vitamins are going to diffuse directly into the blood. This chart shows your fat-soluble and your water-soluble vitamins. Vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble. Vitamins B and C are water-soluble, and you can see the different B vitamins listed on your screen. There are several B vitamins, and we'll go through each of those today. These are some characteristics of fat-soluble versus water-soluble vitamins. We've already talked about the absorption, uh, but in regard to transportation and storage, fat-soluble vitamins must travel with protein carriers in the water body fluids, and they're stored in the liver and or the fat tissues. Water-soluble vitamins, on the other hand, travel freely in watery fluids like the blood, and most are not stored in the body. So water-soluble vitamins, of course, are gonna be excreted much more easily. If you've ever taken a high-dose vitamin C or a B vitamin complex, you'll notice the color of your urine gets darker, and that's because you're excreting a lot of those water-soluble vitamins. Likewise, fat-soluble vitamins are much more likely to become toxic versus water-soluble vitamins uh, we really don't see much of a toxicity across the healthy population because if you get too much, uh, you typically excrete those in your urine uh, fairly rapidly. So again, like I said, your fat-soluble vitamins are vitamins A, D, E, and K. You're going to get those from a number of different uh, food sources, and we'll talk about food sources for each individual one of these vitamins. Storage, like I said, occurs in the liver and in the fat tissues, and so they can become toxic uh, very easily. Now, what's really interesting about research is that in obese or overweight individuals, they actually might need more of a certain vitamin like vitamin D, uh, because when they get stored in those fat tissues, they're not necessarily uh, readily used by the body. So, for instance, in the case of the vitamin D, uh, obese and overweight individuals seem to need more. Now with that, these vitamins don't need to be consumed every day because they are stored in the body. So that makes deficiency uh, much less prevalent 
uh, in the developed world. Now in the um, developing world, you will see much higher uh, deficiencies in vitamins such as vitamin A, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the coming slides. Uh, these vitamins have diverse roles in the body. Uh, we'll go through each of those, um, but very different uh, when it comes to physiological processes and what they are each doing in the body. So first we'll talk about vitamin A. Its precursor is beta carotene. You might know beta carotene uh, as the orange pigment in carrots. Uh, remember carrots are a really rich source of beta carotene. Uh, peppers uh, and brightly uh, colored orange red uh, fruits and vegetables often contain beta carotene. Not always, but often. Uh, beta carotene is a precursor. Again, a precursor means that your body can convert that compound into a vitamin. So in this case, your body can convert vitamin a or beta carotene into vitamin A. And if you'll notice, if you ever take a multivitamin supplement, um, it will often contain most of its vitamin A or a large portion of its vitamin A as beta carotene. And that's because vitamin A can easily become toxic, but beta carotene cannot. So when your body um, synthesizes enough vitamin A from beta carotene, it will stop. There are three active forms of vitamin A in the body. Those are retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. Vitamin A is stored in the liver as retinol. It's also present in both plant and animal sources. Now in plant sources, it's gonna be present in the form of the precursor beta carotene. Animal uh, proteins will often uh, contain vitamin A in the form of retinol, retinal, or retinoic acid. So the major consequence uh, of deficiency is night blindness. And we'll get into this in, in just a minute. But vitamin A is very important in eyesight uh, in how your eye uh, processes light perception. It also helps maintain your cornea, um, which you can see is right in front of your pupil uh, and your lens. Uh, and so you'll see in the next coming slide, uh, deficiency results in night blindness. And if you see on the screen, uh, somebody who is sufficient in vitamin A, if you're driving down the street at night uh, and a car shines its light in your eyes, uh, normally you'll quickly recover and you can see details again in a few seconds. However, in individuals that are vitamin A deficient, uh, they will develop night blindness. And that's when this flash of light uh, momentarily blinds you, but you don't recover for a few seconds or a few minutes uh, because of that pigment in your retina is bleached. So this is a perfect example of night blindness uh, on the left side of your screen. Deficiency in vitamin A can also cause uh, xerophilamia, uh, which is an abnormal dryness of the cornea in the eye. And this occurs with inflammation and also ridge formation. Keratinization uh, simply means the hardening of cells. Uh, so if you look at the picture uh, to your right, uh, you'll see that skin cells uh, are becoming hard in this instance. That's a um, vitamin A deficiency known as keratinization. Xerosis is just the medical name for dry skin. Uh, so when you start becoming low in vitamin A and you get to where you're uh, just becoming deficient, you'll first develop xerosis or dry skin. Now, vitamin A is also very um, important in gene regulation. Remember, in the last lectures, we talked about upregulating and downregulating those genes. Uh, retinoic acid, one of the forms of vitamin A, is very important um, in gene regulation. And thus, it's involved in cell differentiation. Uh, so if you are deficient in vitamin A, you are more vulnerable to infection because your cells aren't differentiating and your immune system uh, isn't at its maximum. That's why individuals uh, who are vitamin A deficient, if you look over in developing uh, countries like in Africa, you can see uh, vitamin A deficiency often uh, makes these individuals more susceptible to 
uh, contracting HIV uh, and other um, communicable diseases because their immune system is weak. So like I hinted, vitamin A, very involved in immune function. Um, and you really see immune function uh, downward spir spiral uh, with malnutrition, uh, especially when you don't get animal sourced foods or so foods with uh, the precursor beta carotene. Uh, these individuals end up developing night blindness. They end up uh, developing uh, decreased immune function. Uh, and it, it's just a really sad case. I should mention that worldwide vitamin A deficiency is the most prevalent vitamin deficiency. Uh, that's mostly in developing countries. In countries uh, that are developed where you have a lot of meat products that are consumed, you very rarely ever see a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, vitamin A is also involved in uh, reproduction and growth especially in your bones and teeth. And you'll see that both deficiency and toxicity uh, in vitamin A can be detrimental uh, to your bones and teeth. And as you can imagine, there uh, is a lot of efforts by international bodies, such as the World Health Organization, to really uh, supplement individuals who might be at risk for vitamin A deficiency. Uh, most of you all have probably seen pictures of the kids uh, taking the vitamin A supplement uh, in developing countries in Africa and Southeast Asia, um, and that's to combat some of these uh, very detrimental consequences of vitamin A deficiency. Uh, toxicity mainly occurs from foods and forti or I'm sorry, fortified foods and dietary supplements. You really don't see vitamin A toxicity uh, from whole foods uh, alone, uh, but some, especially dietary supplements, can contain higher amounts of vitamin A, and that coupled with fortified foods could cause a toxicity. Uh, how do you know if you are beginning to have a toxicity in vitamin A? Uh, typically, you experience skin rashes, hair loss, uh, and hemorrhaging, uh, which obviously is not a good thing because you're you can bleed out in your organs. Um, some of the higher risk groups, again, those who are taking supplements who are who have a low body weight um, can be very at risk to this. In the early 1900s uh, in the US, we combated vitamin A uh, deficiency uh, with uh, liver, uh, cod liver oil uh, and fish oil. Um, food sources that are very rich in vitamin A or liver and fish oil. Uh, also, uh, pro animal protein foods are typically rich uh, in vitamin A, but by far liver and fish oils are uh, the most rich source uh, of vitamin A. So this just kind of gives you a spectrum uh, for vitamin intake. Um, deficiency uh, occurs between zero uh, and 500 micrograms per day. That's when you develop the night blindness, uh, the impaired immunity, the keratinization, um, and the other health consequences that you see uh, on the screen. Uh, when you have normal vitamin A levels, your cells function uh, very normally. If you look at both the cells under the deficient and the toxic uh, categories, you can see uh, in the case of deficiency, you have decreased cell division and deficient cell development uh, versus uh, when you have too much vitamin A, you see overstimulated cells uh, that can divide. Uh, and this is what really causes the skin rashes, the hemorrhages, bone abnormalities, birth defects, um, and then uh, fractures if sustained long term. It can even cause death um, if it's uh, sustained long term. So sources of active vitamin A, we've already mentioned uh, liver. Uh, obviously, a multivitamin contains some uh, active vitamin A. Um, breakfast cereals are sometimes fortified. Uh, energy bars, uh, milk, again, a very good source. Uh, different meats are going to be a good source of vitamin A, such as steak. Beta carotene, the precursor of vitamin A. It's in plant-based foods only, so think about your carrots uh, and your colored foods. Um, it's one of the colorful food groups. 
Uh, so any kind of uh, fruit or vegetable uh, that may be colored is likely to have uh, some level of beta carotene. Uh, beta carotene has been very linked uh, to preventing macular degeneration. And I've talked a lot about macular degeneration in regards to a cousin of beta carotene, lutein, uh, but beta carotene also uh, it very, very um, uh, beneficial to the eye, uh, builds up uh, in uh, the cornea of the eye and important in uh, night blindness once again. Uh, we measure beta carotene uh, activity in retinol activity equivalents. So this basically um, relates the activity of beta carotene to what we would expect uh, for the active form of vitamin A. Unlike vitamin A, we have not established a toxicity for beta carotene. So you really at this point um, can't get a, a, a toxicity from beta carotene. Um, I'll show you in the coming slides uh, the only adverse event uh, that occurs with too much beta carotene is a yellowing of the skin uh, because the pigment again uh, will reach um, your uh, fat cells and your skin cells. And so this is just an example of that. Uh, and so this really is um, the National Academies of Medicine um, identify a skin yellowing uh, from beta carotene as an adverse event because it's not normal, um, but it really has no detrimental effect uh, to health long term. Uh, and again, you typically only get this uh, by taking dietary supplements. I've never seen an individual that is an adult that has had skin yellowing because they've consumed too many carrots. Now, this is common in babies. If you um, give babies the, the mushed up carrots uh, in baby foods and you feed them too much, the babies will experience some type of skin yellowing. But again, this really is not detrimental um, to the health of the infant or an adult. So these slides, I really want you to take a good look at them. Uh, if I had to pick questions from the test, I would focus on these slides for each vitamin. These are kind of the summary slides. I do not expect you to know the dietary reference intakes uh, for each vitamin, uh, um, but I do want you to know the chief functions, uh, the deficiency, uh, the toxicity, and just be able to name some uh, food sources of each vitamin. Um, and in this case, uh, your food sources of vitamin A are gonna be fortified milk, um, and then meat products like liver, uh, steak, uh, whereas beta carotene is gonna be very prevalent in spinach. Um, your, again, orange vegetables like um, carrots and your uh, orangey uh, fruits like apricots. Um, so do know, uh, the chief functions of vitamin A, the maintenance of the cornea, um, how it's involved in regulation of gene expression, uh, how it's involved in uh, protecting your immunity uh, and boosting your immune function in the body. Uh, do know deficiency is night blindness, uh, cornea drying, um, and uh, impaired growth. Toxicity uh, obviously is acute vomiting, uh, nausea, a uh, headache. Uh, again, um, you'll see uh, some birth defects uh, if vitamin A is too high. Uh, and then do know that beta carotene um, is harmless, uh, but it does cause yellowing of the skin if you get too much. So now moving into vitamin D. Vitamin D is not an essential nutrient, uh, and that's because your skin uh, can synthesize vitamin D. Uh, when it's exposed to sunlight. And so uh, you would think that there is uh, not a high degree of deficiency for vitamin D. However, uh, we get very little vitamin D from foods, uh, not really enough uh, to meet the dietary reference intakes or the recommended uh, dietary allowance that the National Academies of Medicine have set. Um, and if you can imagine, uh, in the winter, when you're in class, you're wearing long sleeves, you're not exposed to the sunlight. In the summer, you wear sunscreen, which blocks um, your skin from synthesizing vitamin D. Um, so actually, vitamin D deficiency is fairly prevalent, uh, especially when you go to um, 
uh, places like Canada, uh, where the sun is not directly shining year round, uh, it's colder, people are inside uh, for longer times. Um, adequate vitamin D from sun exposure um, has been suggested to be full arm and leg exposure for 30 minutes, three times a week. So think about that, how many of you all have had full arm and leg exposure to sunlight for 30 minutes, three times this week. Uh, probably not many of you all since it is now March and about 30 degrees outside. So vitamin D is very involved with calcium regulation. Vitamin D um, stimulates your body to absorb calcium from your gut. And it also tells your body to put calcium uh, into your bones. And so several hormones are involved in this. Uh, vitamin D is the only vitamin that is hormonal like. Um, it acts at the genetic level. Um, and so deficiency is going to result in a condition called rickets in children. And I'll show you a picture of rickets in just a few minutes. Um, that's going to be abnormal bone development. Um, in adults, vitamin D deficiency results in osteomalacia, which is basically the softening of your bones. And then again, if you don't have enough vitamin D, you're probably not absorbing enough calcium uh, and thus you're not putting that calcium into your bones. So then you can begin to develop osteoporosis, which as you all know, are weak and fragile bones, which are very prone to fracture. Um, older uh, individuals are more prone to having osteoporosis. They're also more prone to having lower levels of vitamin D because they're less likely to get outside. Uh, think about maybe uh, your grandmother or somebody that, that is elderly that might be in a nursing home uh, and not outside very often, uh, synthesizing vitamin D in their skin. Um, and again, vitamin D is uh, in several types of foods, uh, but not at the levels we really need to be sufficient. Uh, so actually during the winter, I take a vitamin D supplement personally, uh, just because I wear long sleeves and don't get outside. In the summer, I'm a beach bum. I stay at the pool um, all day uh, when I can on the weekends. And so therefore, I um, don't take vitamin D supplements in the summer. So this is an example of rickets in children. You can see uh, it's characterized by the bowed legs uh, in children, but also you see beaded ribs. And this is because, again, their bones aren't developing as they should be. Vitamin D has the potential to be the most toxic vitamin. And this is because, again, it's hormonal-like, but also because um, if you um, increase your blood levels of calcium, which too much vitamin D can do, you can cause vascular calcification and calcification in the kidneys, uh, which can, uh, one, give you a heart attack if you have too much vascular calcification, um, or in the kidneys, it can impair your kidney function, which again can uh, be very stressful on your heart. Um, high doses, again, are really only seen in supplements. Um, in the winter, I take 2,000 IU of vitamin D per day. Um, that's seen as fairly high. I take that because I have a skin condition called eczema, um, which is a psoriasis. Um, and recent research has really shown vitamin D uh, to be protective against uh, breakouts with eczema and um, psoriasis. And I find it to be very helpful. Now, those of you all who don't have a skin condition, if you take, you know, 800 to 1,000 IUs per day in the winter, your uh, serum levels of vitamin D will probably uh, be sufficient uh, for you all uh, to not have to go outside. So here are some factors that affect vitamin D synthesis. Um, we've got advanced age. I already gave the example of the nursing home, but also the skin loses some of its capacity to synthesize vitamin D. Um, anything that would block the sunlight from hitting your skin. So air pollution, um, tall buildings, clothing, sunscreen can all affect how um, you synthesize vitamin D, right? Because it blocks it. 
um, geography in a very similar manner. Um, latitudes above uh, 43 degrees. So when you get to Maine and Canada, um, you see much larger prevalences of vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. Um, and on the contrary, uh, vitamin D deficiency is very minimized in the tropical regions that are close to the equator. Seasonal uh, vitamin D uh, insufficiencies and deficiencies do happen. Again, use the example of staying inside, uh, wearing long sleeves all day. Um, skin pigment. This is very important for individuals who are African American. Um, skin pigment uh, can actually block uh, vitamin D synthesis in the body uh, from sunlight exposure. And it's really interesting because um, African Americans seem to have much lower vitamin D synthesis from sunlight, uh, but they don't have, um, they tend to have stronger bones and are less likely to develop osteoporosis or osteomalacia. So there is a genetic ab adaptation there. Uh, but do keep that in mind. Uh, skin pigment uh, does uh, block uh, vitamin D synthesis. Obviously, the timing of the day would matter uh, depending on when the sun is directly exposed uh, to your body. So the recommendations for vitamin D are really to stay steady throughout life, right? We talked about in the last lectures that osteoporosis starts when you're younger uh, and then the effects happen when you are older. Uh, so it's always good to have enough calcium and vitamin D throughout your lifespan uh, so that you maintain that savings account, which is your bones. Um, sources of vitamin D, an eight ounce glass of milk has about 100 IU of vitamin D. Now, if you can imagine, um, the recommended amounts are 400 to 600 IUs per day. So you would have to drink four to six glasses of milk to get that. Um, there are some other products like orange juice uh, and cereals that are fortified with vitamin D, but again, at very low levels. Uh, and most of us uh, don't get enough vitamin D. In fact, about 90% or more of the population fall short of obtaining adequate vitamin D from foods. Um, so again, sun exposure, very important. Uh, if you're not getting sunlight, then you need to think about supplementing. So again, your summary slide, very important. I don't expect you to know the dietary reference intakes, um, but do know the chief functions, how vitamin D mineralizes bones and teeth, um, and that it can raise uh, blood calcium levels um, by increasing absorption from the digestive tract. Deficiency uh, results in rickets or osteomalacia or osteoporosis. Um, and toxicity, again, elevated blood calcium, which can calcify your soft tissues, uh, such as in your blood vessels uh, and mainly in your blood vessels and your kidneys, but also um, your tissues and your joints. Uh, and this can cause heart attacks and heart failure and excessive problems. Um, again, vitamin D is gonna be rich in fatty fish. I don't know if I mentioned that a few slides ago, but fatty fish are a good source of vitamin D. Um, milk uh, is the leading source of vitamin D in the US diet along with fortified foods. Um, and then dietary supplements, most of your multivitamins are, gonna, uh, are going to have 100% of your uh, recommended dietary allowance or your RDA for vitamin D. Moving on to vitamin E, um, these are the tocopherols. Uh, vitamin E is an antioxidant in the body, and we'll talk about antioxidants in just a moment. Uh, they really prevent inflammation. Uh, your deficiencies in vitamin E are going to uh, cause red blood cell breakage and nerve damage. And actually, it's really interesting. The only studies uh, that we have on vitamin E deficiency are from the 1950s, where they took, I believe it was eight Caucasian male prisoners. They're all adults in their 20s to 30s. And they deprived them of vitamin E until they had what's called red blood cell lysis. Um, so that red blood cell just broke apart. And that caused um, there to be nerve damage. Um, and so really, those prisoners are the only 
um, uh, studies we have on vitamin E deficiency because as we previously discussed, it's not ethical for us to deprive anybody of vitamin E these days. And we now have international and national um, regulations against that. So going back to the antioxidant um, uh, idea, uh, any type of, uh, of oxidation in your body can cause free radicals to form. So think about if you get too much saturated fat, you have too much added sugar, you put too much stress on your body, see how your, your, the dominoes fall down uh, towards the top of the screen. The antioxidant acts as the brick wall. It quenches that free radical and protects those other dominoes from falling over. Uh, and that's exactly what vitamin E does uh, in your body. And so the result of uh, free radicals are cell membrane damage, uh, protein damage, DNA damage, uh, which you all know can cause a lot of problems uh, in the body, um, and then oxidation of LDL cholesterol. And what oxidation of LDL cholesterol means is that it starts sticking to your arteries and it starts to harden and form those plaques that uh, can uh, lead to heart disease. So antioxidants uh, such as vitamin E can stop these uh, chain reactions. So think about that brick wall right there. Now there are other antioxidants in the diet uh, besides vitamin E. Actually beta carotene, the precursor to vitamin A, is also known as a strong antioxidant. Uh, there are other uh, compounds, phytochemicals or, or bioactives uh, in fruits and vegetables. I've talked a lot about the anthocyanins, the purple pigments and berries. They are very strong antioxidants that can do uh, th that are very similar uh, to vitamin E in how they um, protect uh, your body from those free radicals. Um, what these other antioxidants are not involved in are um, red blood cell maintenance and nerve maintenance. So again, deficiency in vitamin E involves red blood cell breakage and nerve damage. So toxicities in vitamin E, um, not very uh, well uh, characterized, at least in the developing world. Um, supplements would be the only um, reason that you would see a vitamin E toxicity. Um, vitamin E requirements are typically uh, more in smokers. So if you're smoking, obviously you're causing an, a lot of oxidation in your body. So your requirement uh, for vitamin E uh, increases. And we'll talk about some of the food sources, uh, mostly your oils. So vitamin E is added to a lot of oils, uh, such as canola oil uh, or your vegetable oils to keep them from oxidizing, from, for, to keep them from going rancid, right? Uh, you can also get vitamin E from dark green leafy vegetables, uh, seeds, um, and you'll see a lot of products like mayonnaise are also fortified uh, with vitamin E um, so that it prevents them pr prevents it from becoming rancid. It makes it more shelf stable. Again, uh, know the chief functions uh, that vitamin E is an antioxidant. Uh, the deficiency causes uh, red blood cell breakage or red blood cell lysis and nerve damage. And uh, toxicity um, is that vitamin E can augment the effects of anti-blood clotting medications. And you'll see this also uh, with vitamin K, um, but do know that. Moving on to vitamin K, uh, the most important thing about vitamin K is it has a role in blood clotting. It also has a role in how proteins in your bone are arranged. Um, but the most important thing about vitamin K is it's involved in blood clotting. And it's not common or it is not uncommon for newborns to be deficient in vitamin K. Uh, and what happens when you're deficient in vitamin K is it can really cause a hemorrhage. Uh, and so infants are often given a vitamin uh, K supplement uh, to prevent a deficiency. Uh, actually, it's, it's fairly common for uh, infants to be um, deficient or insufficient uh, in vitamin K or low in vitamin K. Uh, so that supplement is typically given to them to help them uh, with blood clotting and to avoid uh, that hemorrhaging. Uh, toxicity. 
Um, this also opposes anti-clotting medications. Uh, so if you are, uh, if you have heart disease and you are on a um, medication such as warfarin uh, that wants, that is um, supposed to thin your blood out, uh, vitamin K can oppose this. Um, and so that's not good. So people that are um, on warfarin or blood thinning medications, like people who might uh, be um, prone to blood clots, they should avoid um, vitamin K supplements and foods that contain high uh, levels of vitamin K. Now, vitamin K is very high uh, in your dark green leafy vegetables, uh, and, such as uh, spinach and kale. It's also present in soybeans uh, and other um, uh, vegetables such as, you know, cabbage, asparagus, and your salad greens. Uh, so if you want to get your vitamin K for the day, go eat a nice uh, green salad. Uh, again, know your chief functions, the deficiency, and the toxicities of vitamin K for our exam. Okay, so those are your fat-soluble vitamins. Now we're going to move on into your water-soluble vitamins. Those are your B vitamins and vitamin C. Um, these can easily dissolve in water. Um, they diffuse right into the bloodstream. Uh, and typically when you have too much, um, your body excretes those in your urine uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, you don't see much of an instance of toxicity. In fact, um, in many instances, uh, we have not defined a toxicity uh, level for some of these uh, water-soluble vitamins. Um, sources of these vitamins are going to be fruits and vegetables, but many of your B vitamins are going to be fortified uh, into cereal grains, and we'll talk just a little bit about those uh, as we move along. So first, let's get into vitamin C. Uh, this is very important in collagen synthesis and your connective tissues. Um, so you'll see a lot of skin health supplements uh, contain vitamin C, uh, supplements that uh, are you know anti-aging uh, that promote that collagen synthesis um, not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean those supplements work uh, but vitamin C is involved in your connective tissues your muscle fibers uh, your skin um, and so uh, it often is in those types of supplements vitamin C again a very strong antioxidant uh, but vitamin C is very um, particular in the fact that it protects iron and iron can be uh, a pro-oxidant in the body and you'll often see iron alongside vitamin C uh, because vitamin C um, keeps iron uh, from becoming that pro-oxidant. Now vitamin C as we'll talk about in the next chapter on minerals uh, will also increase um, the absorption of iron. So does it cure a common cold? It has been shown uh, to be very involved in mu immune system function. Uh, but the clinical trials don't necessarily um, suggest that it uh, causes um, prevention of the common cold. But if you are sufficient in vitamin C, we have shown uh, in some smaller clinical studies uh, that it decreases the duration of the common cold. So always good to be um, sufficient in vitamin C. Deficiency results in a condition called scurvy, uh, and you see a, a light example of scurvy on the right side of your screen. Um, you can see the gums uh, of the person, the, the abnormal formation of the gums, uh, and then the spots on the side of the um, elderly gentleman's face are, are a symptom of scurvy. Now, what you might better recognize is you've probably seen uh, little pictures or cartoons of the pirate uh, that has the chipped off teeth uh, and you know the really dry like gross skin uh, that is an extreme example of scurvy uh, and scurvy was one of the first vitamin deficiencies uh, actually recognized uh, when the pilgrims were first coming over uh, to the new world um, from europe uh, many times uh, they developed scurvy and they very quickly learned that if they stored the ship with limes, which are very high in vitamin C, that they could uh, prevent uh, the effects of scurvy. Uh, so they didn't know at the time 
that it was a vitamin C deficiency, but they knew that limes could prevent uh, that condition from happening when they were on those boats uh, for you know months at a time. Again, smokers uh, tend to need uh, more vitamin C uh, since it is an antioxidant. Uh, toxicity, um, there's really not uh, a lot of vitamin C toxicity, again, at just at very, very high levels. What is really interesting is that many scientists think that um, we should be recommending higher levels of vitamin C. And it's really interesting. Humans are the only mammal that does not uh, produce vitamin C uh, endogenously. So we don't produce vitamin C in our bodies. Uh, if you look at monkeys, on the other hand, or any other type of mammal, uh, they produce vitamin C uh, on their own. So it's not an essential nutrient for them. Humans do not do that. Uh, so it is an essential nutrient for us. But a lot of individuals uh, speculating that um, blood levels of vitamin C are very much are, are, are higher in monkeys than in humans. And so that kind of question, should we um, be uh, taking more uh, vitamin C? So some really new, interesting research. You don't really need to know about that for the test, but uh, just for your own knowledge. So food sources of vitamin C are going to be your fruits and vegetables. Uh, again, think of your limes, your citrus fruits. Um, in the U.S., uh, white potatoes tend to drive vitamin C. Now, here's the problem with white potatoes. If you're uh, having a baked potato or, um, you know, a, a plain potato, that's fine. Uh, but vitamin C is destroyed by both heat and oxygen. So if you think about frying a potato, you've almost destroyed um, all of the vitamin C that are in French fries and potato chips, or you have destroyed all of the vitamin C. So just because white potatoes are a good source uh, doesn't mean you're getting that vitamin C from potato chips and, and French fries. So again, your summary slide, know the chief functions, uh, deficiency and toxicity, um, and then know that fruits and vegetables are typically your best sources of vitamin C. And so, you know, I gave you the example about um, how much vitamin C we should have because mammals produce a, a lot more. If you look up towards um, the top of your screen, uh, you see some of the more extreme scientists will uh, recommend up to 4,000 uh, milligrams per day. Uh, that's almost impossible to get from foods. Our tolerable upper intake level is 2,000 uh, milligrams per day or two grams per day. It's not uncommon for people to take a one gram supplement of vitamin C, and there's not really been any toxic effects uh, shown uh, with doing that long term. So this kind of leads me into minimizing vitamin losses. Um, how do you minimize vitamin losses, especially your water-soluble vitamins? They degrade very easily. Um, most fruits and vegetables have an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase, uh, and this causes them to turn brown. So when you cut open uh, a, an apple or you peel a banana and it starts turning brown, that's because they have this enzyme called polyphenol oxidase um, that also destroys certain vitamins like vitamin C and several of the B vitamins. Um, light and air can also uh, degrade many of these vitamins, uh, particularly vitamin C and the B vitamins once again. Uh, so that means it's important to uh, cut your fruits and vegetables and store them in airtight wrappers um, and to store uh, products like milk in opaque containers. So that's why you never see milk in a, a, a container you can see through uh, because the light can affect uh, those vitamin levels and also cause off flavors. Um, in water, uh, you wanna wash your fruits and vegetables intact, uh, not after you cut them. Um, you wanna cook your fruits and vegetables in the microwave or quickly stir fry them. Uh, boiling fruits and vegetables uh, can really cause a lot of vitamin loss. Uh, and then again, and, and you might do something like boil a potato uh, to make mashed potatoes, uh, and that will cause a lot of vitamin loss. Um, and again, avoid high temperatures and long cooking times. 
So now moving on uh, into the B vitamins, uh, these are going to be very important because they function as part of what's called a coenzyme. And we'll go over coenzymes in just a few minutes. Um, but a coenzyme basically combine, combines with an enzyme to activate it. Um, the B vitamins have a role in metabolism. So you'll see a lot of your dietary supplements that uh, promote themselves to increase your energy are going to be full of B vitamins. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, energy per se, as in you're going to want to jump up and down uh, like when you get a caffeine jolt, uh, but energy when it comes to uh, your body's production of energy. Um, and there, the B vitamins are going to be very involved in cell uh, cell division. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to folate. Um, too much of the B vitamins uh, in older individuals might actually be able to progress uh, certain types of colon polyps into cancer. So most older individuals uh, develop colon polyps when they get in their 70s and 80s, and those can uh, turn into uh, colon cancer. That's why we recommend older people have um, have screenings once every 10 years. Uh, and so vitamins like folate uh, that are involved in cell division uh, might speed up that process since they are uh, involved in cell division. So this is how a coenzyme works. Um, you can see uh, two compounds um, go straight into the active site of an enzyme. Uh, the coenzyme uh, uh, compounds A and B are attracted to the active site. Um, and this reaction is completed with the formation uh, of a new product. So the a coenzyme uh, makes the reaction happen. So as you can see, compounds A and B don't really fit into the active site unless there's a coenzyme. So your B vitamins act as coenzymes for literally hundreds of reactions in your body. And we won't get into those specific reactions. Um, this just kind of shows you um, some certain sites where um, B vitamins may aid in metabolism and energy production. Um, I don't expect you to know uh, any of this uh, for the test, but just for your own uh, information, uh, the brain and other uh, tissues metabolize carbohydrates. Uh, those are processes in which uh, enzyme, or I'm sorry, uh, B vitamins are co uh, factors in very many different uh, enzymatic reactions. The same happens with your bone tissues uh, and your new blood cells uh, and in your liver and other sites uh, within the body. So just know that the B vitamins are very involved in metabolism and act as coenzymes. So now um, deficiencies. Um, deficiencies are going to be fairly uniform uh, across most B vitamins. Um, every cell is affected because remember uh, these uh, B vitamins are, uh, are, are involved in enzymatic reactions. They're cofactors. Um, Every, so again, every cell is, cell is affected. Um, the isolated deficiencies are rare. You can see swelling of the tongue is often an indication of B vitamin deficiency. What's more common are your, uh, the sides of your lips being cracked. And where I can really um, think of this happening is uh, if you drink a lot of alcohol, alcohol is a diuretic, it will flush the B vitamins out of your system. And so you'll get that dry skin and those cracked lips. Uh, you know, if you consume alcohol over several days, you see this um, very pronounced in uh, chronic alcoholics. Um, and so um, I actually, if I'm going to have alcohol, I will take a B vitamin complex uh, before and after um, the night that I consume alcohol, just to make sure that I'm repleted uh, in those B vitamins and I don't get those cracks uh, in my lips, which are no fun for anybody. So we'll move right into thymine. Uh, like most other B vitamins, it's involved in energy metabolism of all cells. Uh, it's very involved in nerve cell membranes. Uh, deficiency is uh, called beriberi. Uh, there are several different forms of this deficiency. Again, it's common with alcohol abuse. Um, you can see the picture to your right uh, where the um, uh, uh, 
the doctor is pressing in on the patient's foot uh, and the ankle retains the imprint of uh, the physician's thumb uh, showing the edema of wet beriberi. Um, so there are two types of beriberi, um, wet beriberi, which is characterized by edema, which is fluid accumulation. And then there's dry beriberi without um, the edema. What you're seeing on the screen uh, is a picture of wet beriberi. And again, you really only see this in the developed world um, with chronic alcohol abuse. So most of your food sources of thymine uh, and other B vitamins are going to be fortified or enriched foods like pasta and cereal. Um, naturally, uh, pork chops, green peas, uh, potatoes, uh, and sunflower seeds uh, do contain uh, thymine. Uh, thymine is one of those nutrients that is mandated to be uh, fortified or enriched in refined grains. So it's in white breads and pastas and, and all uh, sorts of uh, refined grain products. Um, again, know your chief functions, uh, your deficiency, um, and there's no toxicity that has really been reported to date with thiamine. Riboflavin is involved again in energy metabolism of all cells. Uh, the deficiencies, uh, very typical again, remember the cracked corners of your mouth. Um, destruction of this vitamin uh, is very easy. Um, UV light, uh, heat, uh, and irradiation uh, can destroy this type of vitamin. Uh, your dietary sources are going to be very similar. It's fortified in uh, several refined grains uh, naturally. Um, it's present in spinach, um, uh, beef liver, uh, certain types of meats. Mushrooms are a good plant source, uh, and you're going to get a lot of riboflavin uh, as well from milk. Niacin. Uh, this one is of particular interest in nutrition. Deficiency is um, described as a condition known as pellagra. You see an um, example of pellagra. Uh, to the right of your screen. Uh, this is um, uh, a flaky paint-like dermatitis uh, that develops on the skin when it's exposed to sunlight. Uh, the skin darkens and flakes away. Uh, this is what is known as pellagra. Uh, this only happens with a niacin deficiency. Um, toxicity um, is a niacin flush. Um, and most of you probably don't know um, uh, what a nice and flush is, but it basically makes a lot of blood uh, go to your head and uh, you become red. Uh, so if you've ever um, uh, had an alcohol flush, uh, especially if you all if you're Asian, um, it's a very similar uh, feeling to an alcohol flush, um, but uh, it's caused by this vitamin. Um, we do nutritionally use higher niacin levels to improve blood lipids. So you can improve uh, your LDL cholesterol, you can lower your LDL cholesterol and your total cholesterol um, by using niacin supplements. Uh, and in younger individuals, that is seems to be a, a good way to keep uh, blood cholesterol levels under control um, if there's nothing else you can do with the diet. Again, uh, niacin uh, in chicken breasts, a lot of your meat products like tuna and pork chops. Again, potatoes. Uh, see, I've alluded to all this course that potatoes really aren't as bad as you think they are. They're actually really nutrient rich. It's just we kind of kill off all the nutrients and they get a really bad rap because of French fries and uh, potato chips. But having a um, baked potato with salsa is actually a good way to get a lot of your uh, essential nutrients. Um, Toxicity and niacin, again, is that uh, niacin flush, that painful flush. Deficiency is pellagra, um, and the chief functions are, um, again, it's part of coenzymes uh, and is essential to, to energy metabolism, just like all the other B vitamins. Okay, folate. We're going to focus a little bit more on folate. Um, uh, deficiency in folate, uh, not very common uh, in in healthy adults or even children. Um, most people get enough folate uh, in the diet. Um, deficiency really occurs in infants. Uh, when women, when pregnant women don't get enough uh, folate, it results in a 
condition called spina bifida. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, spina bifida, you might know also as a neural tube defect. Um, so in adults, uh, outcomes of deficiency can include anemia, diminished immunity, and abnormal digestive function. Um, it can also increase uh, your cancer or increase your cancer risk if you don't um, have enough folate again because it's involved in cell division and if your cells start dividing in a funky way that typically um, sparks uh, the generation of cancer. On the other side, uh, I kind of used the example earlier in the B vitamins uh, lecture um, where there is some speculation that higher folate levels could progress, uh, particularly GI cancers, uh, because again, they're involved in cell division. So if you were developing a polyp, you might more quickly progress that into a, a colon cancer. Um, but that has not been confirmed. That's still uh, just a theory. So this is a picture of an infant with spina bifida or, and or a neural tube defect. Um, in adults, um, the folate toxicity um, will mask a vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, and so that is um, fairly common, especially in African-American women that are older. Uh, they typically uh, don't consume uh, as much B12, uh, but they might consume a lot more folate because it's fortified again in many grain products, many refined grain products. And actually, I have some data here at George Mason University we're just about to publish uh, that show um, people who take uh, multivitamins, uh, it pushes them way over um, their uh, 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 recommended dietary allowance for folate, and it even pushes them over the UL. And again, this is um, really of concern uh, in older populations. We'll talk about, uh, it, because as I told you, it could progress a, a colon polyp, but as we'll talk about uh, when we talk about vitamin B12, um, older people tend to um, absorb less vitamin B12, so they're more at risk to becoming deficient. Um, so high uh, folate levels could mask that deficiency um, from a clinician. So food sources of folate are raw and lightly cooked vegetables. Um, if you're talking whole foods, um, if you're talking uh, uh, how Americans get folate, it's mostly through fortified grains, um, as, such as breads um, that are mandatorily, it's mandated in the U.S. that they are fortified with folate, and that's to prevent neural tube defects or spina bifida. In the um, 19, uh, early 1990s, we discovered that folate was uh, uh, involved in neural tube defects or deficiency of folate was involved in neural tube defects. Um, so we began uh, mandatory fortification happened in uh, late 1998, early 1999. Um, and from then on, we've seen the incidence of neural tube defects in babies decrease. So this has been a very um, huge public health success of fortifying the food supply. We also had another huge success, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture, of iodizing salt and preventing goiters in the early 1900s. So again, uh, know your chief functions. It's part of the coenzyme needed for uh, cell synthesis uh, and energy metabolism. Uh, deficiency in adults um, can promote anemia, uh, which is uh, uh, basically your red blood cells lose their function and ability to carry oxygen uh, to your body. Uh, this also happens with iron deficiency. Um, that's called iron deficiency anemia. We'll talk about this in the next lecture. Um, it also uh, causes you to have the red tongue, uh, depression, mental confusion, weakness are often signs of deficiency as well in adults. Um, and then again, that toxicity, remember, uh, that it masks a B12 deficiency that could end up on your test. Um, good sources of folate are going to be, you know, fortified foods and grains. Uh, naturally, uh, your leafy greens, uh, and then again, your liver, uh, your beef liver, chicken liver, uh, are going to be good sources of folate. And folate is going to be 
um, fortified in the food supply as folic acid. Uh, so when you read the food label, uh, you'll see that uh, if it's fortified in a cereal or if you look on the supplement label and look at your multivitamin, you're going to see fo folate in the form of folic acid, which is okay. Um, vitamin B12 is closely related to folate. Um, it helps maintain maintain the myelin sheaths around your nerve fibers, so it's very uh, important uh, for uh, nerve signaling and nerve function. Uh, deficiency again uh, can promote anemia, so the dysfunction of those red blood cells uh, to bring oxygen uh, to the cells of your body. Um, it is um, absorbed via an intrinsic factor. So this intrinsic factor is a compound produced by your body that helps you to absorb vitamin B12. Now, what's interesting about vitamin B12 is it's mainly present in animal-derived foods. So if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, um, it is likely that you are not getting enough vitamin B12. As you age, you produce less intrinsic factor uh, and therefore you absorb much less vitamin B12. Uh, and therefore, older individuals who are vegetarian and vegan are very much more prone to deficiency. And again, with folate being fortified uh, so highly in the food supply, it's likely that that deficiency could be masked. Um, so again, your chief functions, it's part of coenzymes, helps to maintain your nerve cells. That's the big one, helps to maintain your nerve cells. Um, deficiency, you're gonna see anemia, uh, and then toxicity, there's really none that have been reported. Um, some of your good sources of B12, steak, cheese, milk, dairy products, fish, all your meat products are gonna be good sources of vitamin B12. And it's gonna be fortified uh, in some foods like enriched cereals but predominantly you've got to get your vitamin B12 from foods. It's also, or from animal foods. It's also much better absorbed uh, from animal derived foods than in fortified foods. Vitamin B6, um, all you really need to know is that this uh, participates in over a hundred reactions in the body. Um, the deficiency of vitamin B6, we don't really know a ton about this vitamin, um, but it's deficiency results in your typical uh, symptoms, remember your swollen tongue and your uh, cracked lips. Um, toxicity has been shown to cause depression and fatigue. Um, and some of your food sources uh, are going to be, again, potatoes, green leafy vegetables like spinach, uh, beef liver. Uh, notice the trend here of sources that are good uh, in B vitamins, uh, your liver, baked potatoes, um, and spinach. Uh, so no that um, it's part of a coenzyme uh, that is involved in, it's part of coenzymes that are involved in, in literally hundreds of reactions in your body. I don't expect you to know the individual ones. Um, deficiency results in anemia, depression, confusion. Um, toxicity results in depression and fatigue. Uh, biotin and pantothenic acid. Um, these are two B vitamins, again, we don't know a lot about, uh, but we know they're important uh, for energy metabolism. Uh, both of them act as, or, or I'm sorry, biotin acts as a cofactor for enzymes. Um, pantothenic acid acts as a coenzyme, uh, which are all very involved in energy metabolism. Um, biotin is involved in gene expression, and you might have seen biotin on the uh, on the grocery store shelf or uh, in dietary supplements. Biotin is uh, really good for helping promote hair, skin, and nail growth. Uh, so you'll see this uh, a lot in hair, skin, and nail supplements at very high levels that are 800 to um, 2,000 times uh, the recommended uh, dietary allowance. Um, that's okay. We haven't really found it uh, to be uh, toxic at any level. Choline. Uh, you've heard me talk about choline a lot in this class. This is an area of interest uh, on the research side of mine. Uh, it's widely supplied by choline-rich foods. You do see it in small amounts uh, in certain nuts um, and legumes, uh, but not, uh, very, not in very high levels. Uh, so your predominant sources are going to be um, 
animal derived foods. So eggs are the number one source of choline in the diet. Um, it, the egg yolk um, is very nutritious and houses all of the eggs choline. Um, and that's mainly the eggs and seafood and meat products are how Americans get their choline. And some of the, the research that I've recently published has shown that 90% of Americans don't achieve intake recommendations and only 8% of pregnant women uh, achieve intake recommendations. And that's concerning because uh, very recently, uh, scientists have shown uh, that choline is very involved in neurocognitive development in infants. And there's actually a new study out um, that shows that infants have a much quicker um, reaction processing speed uh, when they the mothers were supplemented with choline during the third trimester. Um, so choline, very important. In fact, um, the mother's breast milk is about 10 times more concentrated than her blood levels of choline. And that's because choline is so important for the infant's uh, neurological development. The body will deplete the mother of choline um, before uh, it spares the infant. Uh, choline, like folate, is a methyl donor. Uh, like folate, um, it can be very involved in prevention of spina bifida. So if you don't metabolize folate correctly, which is a fairly large portion of the population, um, you can actually have uh, spina bifida when you are getting too much folate uh, because you aren't donating those methyl groups um, appropriately. So choline is, in my opinion, uh, just as important as uh, folate to be sufficient in. And your, um, I should mention your uh, deficiency in choline uh, causes fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can very much impair um, and destroy your liver over time. Uh, and, it, you know, it should be noted that about 10% of the general population, so 10% of you in here have fatty liver disease. Um, so it's never a, um, never a bad idea to um, have an egg a day to get that choline. Okay, so to wrap up the, this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about a controversy. Uh, vitamin supplements. What are the benefits and the risks? Uh, and conflict of interest, I worked for the vitamin supplement industry. I still do a lot of research for the vitamin supplement industry today. Um, so I am probably much more of an advocate for vitamin supplements than most of the other professors in the department. Um, who should uh, take vitamin supplements? Um, elderly people with a diminished appetite. So um, most of the time, elderly people don't uh, eat as uh, large of portions or as much food as younger people. Uh, so they might need something like a multivitamin. Again, elderly people uh, tend to not absorb vitamin uh, B12 from foods. Uh, so a B12 supplement could be appropriate. Again, a multivitamin containing B12 uh, could be appropriate in elderly uh, individuals. Um, people with wasting uh, illnesses, so like a muscle wasting disease or a tissue wasting disease, uh, could use supplements to, to offset some of that or to keep their body um, uh, sufficient in nutrients. Um, people who omit entire food groups, so again, vegans or vegetarians, uh, might want to think about taking a calcium supplement, a choline supplement, and maybe even a multivitamin to get that vitamin B12. Um, people who lack the knowledge or money to eat properly. Uh, so where we really see in the U.S., um, where we see vitamin uh, insufficiencies or deficient, even deficiencies um, more prevalent is in uh, low-income populations uh, where they are eating very cheap foods, they're eating a lot of fast foods um, that are energy-dense and nutrient-deplete. Uh, and so recommending a multivitamin uh, to those populations might uh, be a good idea. Uh, that's the subject of a very large debate right now. Uh, there has been a bill that's entered uh, both the House and the Senate um, that would essentially allow uh, individuals on the SNAP program to purchase multivitamins, which I am a supporter of. Um, but a lot of scientists uh, think you should try to encourage those people to get it from foods. I don't think that that's uh, always practical. 
Um, but I think a multivitamin in, the, in that case is. Again, that's a personal opinion. So this is in your book, uh, but this is some valid reasons people might take supplements. Uh, again, people with nutrient shortfalls, um, women who are uh, capable of becoming pregnant, um, they need that prenatal vitamin, especially uh, with folic acid, to reduce the risk of those neural tube defects. Um, pregnant and lactating women may also need uh, iron and folate. Uh, lactating women often need uh, more choline, uh, so they might want to supplement with a choline uh, supplement or eat eggs. Um, newborns are typically, like I said, given a vitamin K dose as a supplement. Um, people who undergo weight loss surgery, uh, this creates nutrient malabsorption issues. If you think about uh, cutting off uh, part of your stomach uh, and the upper part of your intestine, um, they need um, more, particularly vitamin D. You have to give them a lot of vitamin D, um, uh, even 50 to 100,000 IU because they aren't absorbing uh, a lot of vitamin D because they have those malabsorption uh, issues. I'll let you all go through the rest of this chart. I think it's fairly um, uh, self-explanatory. Uh, but those might be some valid reasons that you would take a dietary supplement. Uh, I always take a multivitamin every day. It's just kind of my nutrition insurance plan. Um, I try to eat healthy, but you know, like everybody else, I enjoy a piece of pizza uh, every now and then. Uh, so I really think a multivitamin, uh, and, and I, when I talk about multivitamins, I mean a mainstream multivitamin like a Centrum or a one a day. I think they uh, are really your nutrition insurance policy uh, to prevent uh, insufficiencies and even deficiencies such as in the case of vitamin D or uh, folic acid in pregnant women. Um, arguments against taking supplements. Um, food rarely causes nutrient imbalances or toxicities. You typically only get toxic effects of nutrients through um, supplements. Uh, even fortified foods uh, aren't fortified at really high levels. Um, so you would um, only really see toxicities in the developed world uh, from supplement use. Um, supplement contamination and safety. Uh, again, this is where you really want to choose your national brands, your Centrums, your one-a-days, um, your nature-made uh, products, uh, because those brands um, very much put a lot of money in behind uh, the safety uh, and authenticity of their products. You see a lot of internet, Amazon, mom and, shop, mom and pop shop uh, supplement companies. Those can actually um, be very dangerous. Um, people that aren't nutrition scientists uh, think that they've discovered a great way um, to treat something with a supplement and they start selling it mainstream. Uh, and it can really cause uh, harmful effects across the population. Um, a false sense of security. Don't just think because you take a multivitamin that you can go out and eat pizza every day. That's not the way you should look at it. Uh, one, nutrients are almost always better absorbed from food than supplements. Um, and two, supplements are really made to fill nutrient gaps, to supplement the diet, not replace a healthy diet. Um, and whole foods are obviously the best for nutrients. Can supplements prevent chronic diseases? Um, that you can uh, argue that on an individual basis. There have been uh, many studies that have shown uh, vitamin D may have uh, some uh, uh, helpful effects in preventing cancer. Uh, obviously, vitamin D has been shown to prevent osteoporosis. Um, antioxidant supplements, um, you know, <clears throat> It's best to get your antioxidants from food because then you're also getting, you know, even though you can take those um, blueberry anthocyanins and put them in pill form, and yes, there might be some benefit to them, um, but um, if you eat blueberries, then you get all the other micronutrients, all the other antioxidants, the dietary fiber and all that kind of stuff uh, within the food. So while supplements can be a good thing, again, to supplement the diet, um, don't think that they're necessarily a, a cure-all. Um, the same goes for uh, vitamin E and beta carotene. Uh, vitamin E, you kind of have to watch. There are many different forms of vitamin E. The natural forms uh, seem to um, be better 
uh, when it comes to chronic disease prevention uh, as compared to the synthetic forms that you might get from a supplement. And these are just some invalid reasons uh, for taking supplements. Um, you can read over those in your book, uh, in, in the table, uh, but you really want to um, not use supplements if you've been diagnosed with a disease. You need to talk to your doctor about what supplements are right for you because some of those um, antioxidant vitamins could um, end up and become harmful with certain disease states. So when I say supplementation is appropriate, it's really appropriate if you're a healthy individual. Um, if you've got cardiovascular disease or cancer or some other type of chronic condition, you really need to talk to your doctor before you uh, start taking a dietary supplement. So how to choose supplements. Uh, again, the national brands are always the best ones to go for um, because typically they're the better quality ones. Um, you know, a Centrum uh, or a one a day is not going to risk their brand by, you know, cutting corners. Uh, because those are huge multi-million dollar brands. Um, read the labels. Um, know what you're getting from that supplement. I see this all the time in my friends when I look at their supplements. They often take a hair, skin, and nails supplement and a multivitamin, and it's got many of the same nutrients in it. Uh, that's a very easy way to get a toxicity of a certain nutrient. With that, target your needs. Uh, I know that um, I don't drink a lot of milk. And I don't go out in the uh, sunlight in the winter because uh, I'm inside teaching. I'm wearing long sleeves. Therefore, I take a calcium and vitamin D supplement uh, because I don't drink a lot of dairy. So know your own personal needs when it comes to supplements. Uh, and with that, choose your doses. Um, always try to get uh, the recommended amount of a nutrient, um, but know that there's not really any more benefits to exceeding uh, that recommended amount. Uh, the quality of supplements can again vary. Um, avoid uh, purchasing supplements that aren't national brands on uh, websites, uh, even on Amazon, uh, because you can really get a, a, a product that's not quality and that could actually be dangerous. And avoid marketing traps. Um, if uh, the claim is too good to be true, that's probably because it is. Um, you're not going to lose you know, 20 pounds uh, in a week by taking a dietary supplement. Um, and any kind of uh, supplement that makes those kind of claims uh, should be reported to the FDA. Again, this is just an example of the supplement facts label. Um, you're going to see uh, that the supplement facts label um, uh, shows the quantity and the percent daily value for all nutrients listed. Um, and it looks very similar uh, to the food label, uh, the Nutrition Facts panel. Uh, and both of these labels will uh, soon be updated. So that is all for this lecture.